video is for you if you've heard the phrase object-oriented programming before, but you have no idea what it is, you just know that you should probably learn about it. Now this video assumes you've already watched my JavaScript in half an hour video, so if you don't already know how to create a new JavaScript file, add it to an HTML page, and open the Developer Tools console in your web browser, I'd recommend watching that video first. Having said that, let's roll up our sleeves and jump over to our text editors in a new blank JavaScript file that we've already included in an HTML page. And let's begin by simply logging a test message to the console. So we can say console.log quotes, this is a test. Now if we save this and jump to the browser and refresh, and here we see this is a test. Let me make this text a bit larger so it's easier to read. All right, and now let's jump back to our text editor and try something a bit more interesting. Let's log another message to the console that reads, hello, my name is John Doe and my favorite color is blue. And then let's actually copy and paste this entire line. And in the second copy, let's change the name to Jane Smith and let's change her favorite color to green. Now if we save this and refresh the browser, no surprises here, this is exactly what we would expect. But as a developer, as a programmer, this code should drive you insane because it is very repetitive. The only unique aspects of each line are the name values and the color values. Everything else is part of a pattern that we can define once and then recycle. So let's delete all of this code and let's create a function that we can use time and time again. So let's give this new function a name of person. And what do we want this function to actually do? We want to log a message to the console that reads, hello, my name is blank and my favorite color is blank and we want to include a closing period, and we want to end this line with a semicolon. Okay, now we can simply call this function once for John and once for Jane. So down on a new line, let's call the person function that we just created. Let's fill in this first blank value by passing an argument of John Doe, and then we can fill in the next blank by including a comma and passing an argument of blue. Let's add a semicolon here, and now let's call the person function again for Jane. So the first argument is her name, Jane Smith, and the second argument will be her favorite color, green. So if each time we are calling the person function, we are passing it two arguments, a name and a color, we better make sure that up in our function definition, we include two parameters to receive those incoming two arguments. Let's call the first one name, and let's call the second one fave color. Okay, now within the actual body of our function, we can access the argument values that are being passed in by replacing these blanks with the name of our parameters. There is no magical variable named blank. I only added that temporarily as a placeholder. So let's replace this first blank with our name parameter and let's replace the second blank with our fave color parameter. So if I save this and refresh in the browser, we see that nothing changes. The exact same two sentences are being output, but behind the scenes, we know that our code is less repetitive. Let's go ahead and take things a step further and continue to improve our code. So within this hypothetical application, we can imagine that maybe in the future, we would need to reference John's name again or his favorite color again. Now, because we didn't store these values anywhere, if we wanted to reference these values outside of this function, we would have to manually type out John Doe again, and we would have to manually type out blue again, and that would be repetitive. Now, one way around that would be to create individual variables. So for example, we could say var John name equals John Doe. And we could create another variable named John fave color equals blue. And then we can use these variables throughout our entire application. So for example, when we call the person function for John, 
instead of actually spelling out any values, we can simply pass in those variable names as arguments. So we could say John name, comma, John fave color. And if I save this and refresh in the browser, we see the exact same result. So our code is technically working. We are storing data about John within these variables, and then we are accessing that data later on. But we can do better. This code just feels a bit sloppy or disorganized to me. Because you and I know that these two variables are intrinsically related to each other. They are both about John. But currently, we don't see that relationship reflected in our code. So the question becomes, how do we add structure to our data? Well, remember that this is a lesson on object-oriented programming. So surprise, surprise, the thing that is going to save us here is an object. So let's delete these two individual variables and instead create an object for John. So let's say var John equals and a pair of curly brackets will create an object. Now within this single object, we can add anything and everything that has to do with John. So we can give this John object a property of name, and we can give it a value of John Doe. And we can give this object another property named favorite color, and give it a value of blue. So now all of our data about John lives within a single unified John object and accessing these object properties is a piece of cake. So for example, down within this function call, these variables no longer exist. So we want to replace these with references to the object properties. So if we want to access John's name, we can reference this property by simply typing John dot and then the name of the property that we want, so name. All right, and we can access the favorite color property by simply typing the name of the object, John dot favorite color. So if I save this and refresh in the browser, once again, we see the exact same result. Now at this point, you might be wondering why there's a big fuss over objects. What's the big deal? I mean, yeah, it's nice that we added a bit of structure to our data, but this doesn't feel earth shattering. You might be thinking that object oriented programming is a bit overhyped. But what if I told you that we can store more than just simple properties or variables like this within an object? What if I told you that we can also store functions within an object? Ah, so this is where things get a bit exciting. Let's go ahead and delete this function that we've been working on. And let's also delete these two calls to that function. And let's go ahead and add a function within this John object. So at the end of this line, let's add a comma. Let's create a new piece of this object named greet. And greet is not going to contain data like these two lines. Greet is going to contain behavior. So greet will be a function. As a quick example, let's make this function log out a bit of text to the console. Console log o hello. Now if I save this and refresh in the browser, we see that our console is empty. And that's because we defined the function, but we never called the function. Now just like we accessed these properties by typing john.name or john.favoriteColor, we can call this function by simply typing john greet. So if we save this and check out the browser, we see oh hello. This means that one variable or object can contain all of the data and behavior that it needs to operate. So object oriented programming is about getting into a mindset where you stop thinking in terms of individual loose variables and functions, and you begin thinking in terms of cohesive self-sufficient objects. And an object is just an entity that has data and behavior. Or another way of thinking about it is that it's an entity that has nouns and verbs. So in our example, John is the object, name is a noun, favorite color is a noun, greet is a verb. It's an action, it's a behavior. We used a function to make something happen. Now just a really quick vocabulary note, in the programming world, when we have a function that belongs to an object like this, 
We no longer refer to it as a function, but instead we call it a method. And we could add as many different methods to this object as we wanted. So John is a person. What sort of things can a person do? We could add a walk method or a run method or a jump method. You get the idea. So now that we have a general understanding of what an object is, let's go ahead and complete the greet method. Because we didn't just want it to say, oh, hello. We wanted it to say, hello, my name is John.name. And my favorite color is John.favorite color. And then add in a closing period. And if we save this and refresh in the browser, we see our same old trusted sentence. That's great, but remember we didn't just have John whose favorite color is blue. We also had Jane Smith whose favorite color is green. So how do we want to create a new object for Jane? Well, I mean, we could just copy and paste this. So copy, paste, and then within this new copy, we could just change the variable name to Jane and fill in these values. So Jane Smith, favorite color green. You get the idea, we could update all of this for Jane. But ugh, let's not do that. It would be very repetitive because the greet method for both John and Jane is identical. And there's no good reason to spell out functionality like that more than once. So this was a bad idea, let's delete it. Now there are several different ways to create an object. The way that we created the John object gets the job done, but it isn't the most efficient tool for the job when we want to create multiple objects that are very similar to each other. So let's actually delete everything that we have and try something new. Let's create a reusable blueprint or recipe that spells out what a person object should be. A reusable blueprint for objects is commonly referred to as a class. In JavaScript, we can create a reusable blueprint like that by leveraging something called a constructor function. So let's create a new function. Let's name it person. And in the programming world, it's a common convention to begin our blueprint name with a capital letter. We don't have to do this, it's just a stylistic thing that will make our code easier to understand for other developers. Now you might be thinking that this looks like a regular function. What makes it a constructor function? Well, it all depends on the way that we actually use the function. So check this out. We know that we are going to want to create an object named John, but instead of opening up a pair of curly brackets and listing all of the properties and methods that we want, we can simply say new person. The word new in JavaScript is an operator that will create a new instance of our person object type. Or in other words, this will create a new object using our person blueprint. This means that our John object will contain anything that we list within this constructor function. So let's say that all person objects should have a method named greet. Within this constructor function, we can simply say this.greet. We will learn what the keyword this means in just a moment, but for now, let's complete this method. Equals, and then create a function. As a quick example, let's just log out a bit of text to the console that says, hello there. Now, because we added this method to our blueprint or recipe, this means that our John object now has a method named greet. So let's test it out. Let's take it for a spin. Let's say John dot greet. So if we save and refresh in the browser, hello there. So we know that we are also going to want to create a Jane object. So let's say var Jane equals new person. And we can rest assured that Jane also has a method named greet. So if I save this, we see hello there once from John and once from Jane. Now just a moment ago, I promised that we would learn what the this keyword means. The this keyword is what allows our blueprint function to be flexible, to be recyclable. The value of this changes depending on how, when, and where this function is called. So let's walk through an example. When we create the John object, and we call the constructor function. 
in that particular instance, the this keyword refers to our John object. But when we call this function again to create the Jane object, in that instance when this function runs, the keyword this has a value of the Jane object. So I think you get the idea. We can use the this keyword to refer to whichever object is currently being created. All right, now let's get back to the task at hand because our work is not complete yet. Remember that we also wanted each person object to store the person's full name and their favorite color. So let's add a couple of properties to our blueprint in order to store that data. So we can add a new line. Let's begin with their name. So this.name equals, and we can't just type John Doe because we want our blueprint to be recyclable. We want this to make sense for all objects, not just the John object. So what we can do instead is include each person's full name as an argument when we call our person constructor function. So down on this line for John, we can include an argument with his full name, John Doe. And let's do the same thing for Jane, Jane Smith. And then within the signature for our constructor function, we can add a parameter to receive that incoming name. We could name the parameter anything we'd like. Let's just go with full name. And then within this function, on this line, we can just say this.name equals full name. All right, now let's also store each person's favorite color. So down here, when we call the constructor function once for each object, let's include another argument with their favorite color. So John's is blue and Jane's favorite color is green. Let's add a second parameter to our person function to receive that incoming color value. Let's call it fave color. All right, and then let's add a property for each object named favorite color. And it should simply equal the color that is getting passed in. So fave color. All right, now at this point, anywhere within our application, if we wanted to access John's name, we could simply type john.name. Or if we wanted to access Jane's favorite color, we could simply type jane.favoriteColor. But we don't need to do that. What we do need to do is update our greet method to use our old trusted text. So we didn't just want this to say, hello there. We wanted it to say, hello, my name is this.name and my favorite color is this dot favorite color and then add a closing period. So if we save this and refresh in the browser, we see the two sentences that we were hoping to see. Only this time our code is object oriented. So now that we have these clean objects with these useful methods, our code down here feels squeaky clean. It's very easy to read and immediately understand what's going on. And now that this code is complete, we don't really need to look at it or think about it. It would be nice if we could tuck this class code away into a separate file so that it's out of sight, out of mind. And that is exactly what we are going to learn how to do in our next lesson. Let's keep things rolling and I will see you then. Thanks for watching this excerpt from my new Get a Developer Job course. I hope you feel like you learned something. And if you'd like to check out the full video course, there's a link to it in the description. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll see you in a new video next Tuesday.